I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And I am pretty sure as a bookseller that, well, Rick Riordan's pretty responsible for quite a lot of readers. And I don't think Rick will necessarily say that because if you've met him, he's a very subdued kind of guy. But I will tell you, I really, really, really think that Percy Jackson and the Heroes of Olympus and the Kane Chronicles and, oh, Magnus Chase, and of course, the Rick Riordan Presents series, I think you've done quite a lot for younger readers who are now adult readers. It's pretty exciting to see. Did you ever think we'd be here? Did you really think that the ser- all of your work would just take off the way it has? Oh, no. No, not at all. I mean, uh, you know, I, when I was a, a kid, I, I knew that I wanted to do two things in life. I wanted to be a teacher and I wanted to write. And I was very lucky that I got to do both. But doing it at this level, no, never, never even entered my mind. It's really been wonderful to see the growth. I've been a bookseller for your entire career. And it's been really fun to see and also be able to talk to readers at different points in their lives about you. I mean, I've got the older readers now where I'm like, oh, you came up reading Rick. And then, of course, we've got this whole new generation of short set readers who are just kind of like, have you ever heard (laughs) this guy, Rick Ryan? And we've got an entire TikTok generation calling you Uncle Rick, which all of this (laughs) delights me to no end, as you can tell, because anything that gets young people talking about books is exciting to me. And you went back to Percy Jackson for this new novel, Chalice of the Gods. Very true, I did. I thought we were done. I thought we were done with The Last Olympian, all respects, but I was not expecting this book. I'm delighted to have it. No, me neither. I was not at all expecting this. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's been uh, 14 years since the last book in which Percy was the narrator, and we had a full novel from his point of view. Was not expecting it at all. But as with so many things in my career, it came, kind of came out sideways, you know, not something I was expecting. But we were talking to Disney after the acquisition of Fox and trying to uh, bang on some drums and, you know, tell them that Percy Jackson was this thing. It was a property that they now owned, and it would be really cool if we could make a great adaptation about it. And as part of that, I kind of pitched the idea that, well, you know, if you guys are interested in doing that, I I would even be willing to go back and maybe write about Percy again uh, to sort of promote the show in that way. And so I came up with these ideas about Percy being a senior in high school and how he would have to get these recommendation letters from the gods, which struck me as funny. I mean, I've been through the college process now with my kids, and I know how stressful that is. It turns out I didn't need those ideas, but they they stuck around with me. So when we did get the show up and running, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and try that. And it was so much fun to go back into Percy's point of view. I mean, you told The Hollywood Reporter though that you were slightly anxious about going back. And I thought, but you created him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, sure, but it's been a long time. Uh, 14 years is a long time. Percy hasn't aged as much as I have in that time because he's he's in his own timeline. But nevertheless, I mean, to try to recapture that voice is uh, something I didn't know whether I would be able to do. But I I think I think the readers will be pleased. I think that uh, Percy Reads is slightly older, which he is. Yeah. But he's still Percy. He's uh, got the same you know sarcastic attitude the same, uh, you know, problems of being a demigod, and he's still, yeah. you know, got his friends at his side. So they're, uh, they're having a pretty good time there as, as much as you can when you're a demigod. And I have to say the new book flies. It, I mean, all of your books oh, fly, but this one particularly, I just, part of it, I was just curious to see what you were going to do. And if I remember correctly, this sits between the last book of Heroes of Olympus in that series, and the last, book of Trials of Apollo, right? So for folks right. who know the timeline cold, this is where that is. So we're we're backtracking a tiny bit to revisit Percy's senior year, which I kind of like that idea quite a lot because you do some fun stuff with nostalgia. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I, that is exactly where it sits. And uh, it seemed like that was an unexplored year. It seemed like uh, a good place to kind of drop these in. Uh, yeah, I've been very pleased. It's neat to kind of just spend time with Percy, Anna, Beth, and Grover sort of in their natural habitat and see what they're up to. Although I will say, as someone who cuts through Washington Square Park pretty much every day to get to the office, I may not see the park the same way ever. (laughs) (laughs) That may just be me. (laughs) You know, it's an interesting place. There's always something fun going on there. So I figured, 
you know, that'd be a nice place to hang out. But you mentioned also this new series that's coming. And part of me wonders, I mean, you've been living with these characters in this world since before publication in 2005. I mean, these we mm-hmm. know you, these started, the Percy Jackson stories that they started as bedtime stories for your sons. You're very involved, obviously, but at the same time, you do hand over. It's a different experience when you're creating mm-hmm. something for the screen. And you are, by nature, very collaborative. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. You're collaborative on the page. You're collaborative in publication. There, there are a million different things. But what's it like... And I cannot wait to see the three actors who've been hired to do the Disney series. I just, they look adorable and I cannot wait to see them bring your characters to life. But what's it like for you having another facet to the world? Uh, Well, it was a very long process of getting here. It Mm -hmm. was not sort of an environment that I was familiar with. So it was kind of learning how to create a story in a totally different way. And so in a way, the writing of Chalice of the Gods and the creation of the TV show dovetailed with each other very nicely, because in both cases, I was going back to the roots of Percy Jackson and remembering what that was all about and how to construct those voices. So one definitely informed the other, but they are very different processes. The film industry, that's a team sport. No one, I mean, unless you're funding your own independent project and doing everything yourself, no one creates anything by themselves. It's all a collaborative group effort. So that that already is very different than me, who by and large just sort of sits in my office and writes a book and I write what I want to write. And of course, my editor will help me and, uh, you know, uh, my family will weigh in. But really, it's my story and it's just me. So just in that way, it's very different. There there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen, but that's good because I, I this is not a process that I know. So I have learned mm-hmm. a lot about it. It's been really challenging, but really mm-hmm. also very fascinating to see how that happens. I have to say the visuals look fantastic. For small screen, and I realize, you know, the game has changed quite a lot with streamers and whatnot, but the visuals look really great. And I I think it's a combination of live action, but also there is a little bit of CGI, I'm assuming. There are things you cannot do with child actors, (laughs) but it looks fantastic. It really, I'm so excited for December. I have to say, we have an incredible team, and I have a great amount of respect now for how hard it is to make a television show and how many people Mm -hmm. uh, put in so many hours to make something uh, like like what we're trying to make. It's a very ambitious show, and the entire team is just incredible. And you say that as a person who has, what, roughly 190 million copies of your books in print, (laughs) and that doesn't include the Riordan Presents, right? That's, that's... No, I don't... Uh, books uh, under your byline is 100, yeah, 190 no, million. I, I, I can't. I mean, that, that number's too big for me to even wrap right. my head around. I, I, I should be like McDonald's and have one of those signs in my house for <laughs> so many served. But um, no, I don't I don't keep track. But yeah, the, the, uh, the Riordan imprint is uh, definitely something that I love. It's not my, you know, it's not my IP. It's not me writing it. It's really more just about me being um, an excited uh, book talker and cheerleader, you know, support person as much as I can for these wonderful authors that are doing their own takes on mythology. That's partially why when I think of you, I think of you as a collaborative writer. I mean, this book that you just did with Marco Shiro, Mm. Star in the Sun. I mean, listening to the two of you talk about this book. Oh, it's so lovely. It's you knew that you needed a co-author for this particular project, even though it sits in Percy Jackson's world because of Nico and Will and their relationship. And you were like, well, you know, I should get some help if I'm going to render LGBT characters as they should be rendered. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask for a hand. And I really respect that. That you're able to say, hey, I, I do want to expand my world and I want to make more, but I need a hand. And Mark is yeah. just a lovely guy. Mark is great. And they have a, an entirely different set of skills when it comes to approaching a story than I do. And that was really um, helpful to me and and really kind of an educational experience, too. It is interesting. All these projects have kind of happened and come to fruition around the same time. The TV show the new Percy Jackson book, The Sun and the Star, and all of them were really about learning to 
reinvent Percy's world and collaborate with other voices to right. bring that some more um, three-dimensionality. Yeah, it was a great experience. It's interesting you describe me as a collaborator because before this year, I don't think I would have used that word for myself. I was really very much, really very much of a, you know, sort of do my own thing. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the creator. I'll take it as a compliment because it it's, been, <laughs> it's been a great, uh, a great experience to kind of expand. I mean, I remember reading in PW very clearly, even though this was why this is 2016. And I went back and I found the piece, but I remember seeing the announcement that Rick Riordan Presents was coming mm. and that you were going to do sort of four books a year. And you were not, in fact, going to write these books, but that you were going to tap other people to do it. I just remember walking around the office smiling like a crazy person, probably for about a week, because I knew what the potential was going mm. to be. And it's a combination of you responding to your readers saying, well, couldn't you do Japanese and couldn't you do, you know, other cultures? And you were kind of like, well, mm, not the best idea, but, you know, we can do Chicano and Hindu. And it's wonderful what you've been able to The Cuban, I mean, I know I'm mm -hmm. yeah. there's Mesopotamian. We have Hmong as well. Like, it's really yeah. so fabulous to see and such a fun recommendation for parents and educators and adults in with small people in their orbit just to be able to say, hey, listen, if you want something slightly different, but has the feel right. of a Riordan. Yeah. So thank you for all of that. But do we get more than four books a year? Or are you really comfortable with four books a year? <laughs> oh, I think I, I think four was sort of an, a beginning goal. But I think okay. if, if we look at, you know, what's actually coming out a year, it's much okay. more than that. Okay. Uh, be, because... You have the first book, perhaps, in a series, but then you have also the follow-up books from the year before and the follow-up books from two years before. And so, for instance, I think I'm going to be on tour this week and mm -hmm. talking about what's coming up in uh, the Read, Write, and Presents world. And I think just for the year to come, I mean, I think we're talking about 10 books that are coming right. out from That's different so authors. Funny. It's a... it's really succeeded, I think, beyond my hopes. I wanted to do this because I felt really strongly about it. And I knew that there were so many great stories out there. I knew there was a hunger for, for stories like this, but I didn't, mm -hmm. I think, anticipate that it would do as well as it has. And it's been fantastic to see. You know, one of the things that I really appreciate about the Riordan Presents line, too, is you're working with writers who are established, like Daniel Jose Older, and also Rebecca Roanhart. So, Everyone's getting a shot, basically, is what I'm saying. You ha you have this giant tent, and you're saying to everyone, come on in. Let's look at what we're doing here. I mean, you've done it. You've had deaf characters, and you've had characters with physical challenges. And, you know, obviously, Percy with his ADHD and his dyslexia. I mean, I love the fact that you can pin these kids and say, hey, wait a minute. This isn't actually a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing you still get a lot of mail. <laughs> 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 it's always fun to see um, readers discovering the books, whether they're the imprint titles mm -hmm. or whether they're my books. But you're right. I mean, this is at the core. This is how Percy Jackson started. It was mm -hmm. a way to tell my son, you have learning differences. That is not a bad thing. Difference is a strength. Lean into it. Find out how you succeed and you will do just fine in this world. And I think that's true for all kids. I mean, the world mm -hmm. is full of different kinds of kids and it's important for them to know that they're seen and valued, whoever they are. And I'm just going to take a second and point out that your oldest, Haley, he of the ADHD and dyslexia, now holds a master's in higher education with a certificate in learning differences. And I love the idea that he can just go out into the world now and help kids who are like him or maybe unlike him. We'll see. Um, yeah. But I think it's true. It just makes me so happy to know. I, I could not be prouder. He decided, you know, what I want to do in my life is give back and mm -hmm. help the kids who are coming up like I did and need accommodations like I did. And he is now kind of my go-to learning differences expert. You know, he knows tons of things. He works full-time at a, a, a university locally here and really has a rewarding uh, job and, mm -hmm. and is good at it. So uh, he found his place. That's awesome. Do your sons still read early? 
versions of the novels, or are they saying, "Hey, Dad, they we will. You, but we don't have time." <laughs> they will if I ask them to look at it. Like if it's a new project, if it's something that they haven't seen before, uh, I will ask them to take a look. And they are very good editors. So yes, my my wife Becky and both of my sons are kind of my first line of um, quality control. And then mm-hmm. it goes out from there to my editors. You have yourself now a master's in Gaelic literature from University College in Cork. Yeah. You also thought perhaps you might take up a PhD program in Celtic mythology mm-hmm. at Harvard. Yeah. As a kind of semi-retirement. And as I say that in a recording, I worry about all of the people whose hands just went up in the air and said, what? But I want to talk about your evolution as a storyteller and the idea that, you know, you would really like to go back to school, even at this point in your career, when Mm. you're very established. And where that would take you, because clearly you connect with your audiences, regardless of age. Mm. Clearly you connect with the art of story, whether it's in print or on the screen. I was really surprised to hear that you'd gone back to school and and were thinking of really sort of a PhD program is not a small thing to undertake while you're touring and writing at least two books a year and overseeing your own imprint and EPing a television series. No, uh, and it, no, and it, and it wouldn't be possible. I think at the core, what it really is about is that I have always considered myself and always wanted to be a lifetime learner. I think that's critical for being a teacher is that you also see yourself as a student, that you're always learning. You find learning fascinating, Uh, learning about new cultures, learning about new literature, learning about how people in the world do things and Mm -hmm. the history of it. And I I love that. And so Mm -hmm. when I began to explore the idea of writing about Celtic mythology, I wanted to know more about it, and that led me to taking some summer courses and some language courses in the Irish language. And uh, I'm lucky enough to be in Boston, so Harvard is kind of, you know, a a very close-by resource. I got to know the people in the Celtic uh, Studies Department. And I felt that, um, this was back in 2019, I guess, that it would be a really fun thing to do. Challenging, absolutely, but really fun to go through the PhD program and put in the time, put in the okay. effort to really become an expert in the subject matter. Unfortunately for me, I had gone through the process, done the application, taken the GRE, gotten recommendation, you know, just like any other applicant would, and had gotten my acceptance letter to Harvard and was ready to start when I got the word that the TV show for Percy was going to be going ahead. And so I had to make a choice. Do I do the PhD program or do I become an executive producer? And I really wanted to be a student. I have never wanted to be an executive producer. <laughs> um, film film is just, I mean, I, it just doesn't interest me. I mean, it's just not my world. However, I really felt like it was the right thing to do for the readers for kind of the legacy of the Percy Jackson world to try to make a good adaptation. So I told Harvard that unfortunately I had to decline and I had to do this other thing. I dove into that instead and I treated it the same way I would have if I were going into a PhD program. I I was a learner. Uh, I dropped into that environment of film and I tried to learn as much as I could. Yeah, I have to say that the more episodes of the show that we produce, it has occurred to me that I possibly should have done more independent study when Mm. I was younger, because each episode in its own is a complete education or a revisiting of work that maybe I encountered for the first time when I was a teenager. And uh, it's been a trip. It's been an absolute trip to really sit down and and be able to approach someone's work as a whole. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally get that. But you were a reluctant reader. I didn't know this until recently that, you know, sort of the Lord of the Rings is the thing that got you on the track, but James and the Giant Peach and the Phantom Tollbooth, but Mm. you in high school, and this is leading me up to your Shakespeare thing, just so you know, but you (laughs) in high school, you were not reading outside of whatever was assigned for home. It just wasn't your thing. No. And I also wasn't reading what was assigned to me. So there was that. 
I mean, I was a very indifferent student. Uh, it's true. But I had, I think the first spark was in eighth grade when I had a wonderful English teacher who uh, was the one that found out I had read The Lord of the Rings. That was like the one success I had had as a reader that I thought, oh, wait, reading can be fun. She took that and opened the door to the world of Norse mythology, to the world of creative writing. She encouraged me to submit my stories to publication. They were never published, but it, it started me on that road. But yes, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons I write the way I do and the way I taught, the way I taught when I was in the classroom, is because I have a great deal of empathy for reluctant readers and um, you know students that aren't the A plus students that for whatever reason just don't find the classroom engaging and they're they're the ones I want to reach. I mean, I, I love the the avid readers, fantastic, but they're going to read. <laughs> the, the ones that don't normally read are the ones I try to reach. Mm -hmm. I genuinely believe that there is a book for every reader and that the people mm -hmm. who tell me that they do not like to read, which I try to keep a neutral expression when they say that, but mm -hmm. um, I do genuinely believe they just haven't found the book that is going to make their head explode. Absolutely. And that's part of the joy for me as a bookseller is saying, well, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you heard of this guy? But what's even more fun is really when you have a reader come to you and say, well, have you Yes. And you get to watch their face sort of light up. It is absolutely the best feeling in the world. But you are also a Shakespeare fiend. And I'm wondering if that means we'll ever see sort of a Riordan presents Shakespeare, because it is a different kind of project, right? Like, yeah, yeah. It is sort of part of a very classical education, but it doesn't really fit into the Riordan presents that you have now. But wouldn't it be fun? And plenty of people have done them. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting anything sure. new. But I would like to read your take. <laughs> I have not considered that actually. Okay. It's a it's an interesting idea. I haven't really done much with Shakespeare. Oh gosh, I mean, in years and years and years. I oh, mean, okay. I used to I used to do it with my students. Talk about the ultimate challenge. I mean, try to make eighth graders get into Shakespearean English. It's not the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. It can it can be done though. I think part of it is is the same approach I take with Greek mythology, is you have to sort of embrace the strangeness of it yeah. and kind of agree with your students that, yeah, this is a little weird, <laughs> that this is the story and this is the words, that they, these are the words that they used. and But to kind of uh, enjoy the weirdness of it and enjoy the challenge of figuring out how people in Elizabethan England talked and why they talked that way. So yeah, I, I agree. There's a lot there that could be written about. I'm not sure if it'll be something that I do, but yeah, it's a, definitely a font of uh, all kinds of inspiration. I mean, part of why I think of it too, though, there's a physicality to Shakespeare's plays. The books, especially with Percy Jackson, they're not just adventure stories. They're not just action stories. There's a lot happening on multiple levels, and there mm. is a physicality to Percy and Grover and Annabeth and the other campers that I think for kids, especially, it's really refreshing to see because it isn't just the action, right? That mm. you have this balance of the cerebral and the physical. And how much of that is you letting sort of Percy and gang lead the way? And how much of is that you saying, I remember what it was like to teach eighth graders after lunch? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a little of both, but it's... Uh... It's certainly true that my goal is always to create a story that I could share with my fifth period class when they're just about to check out and not feeling great and not really engaged and to mm -hmm. try to make it so interesting that they're going to be learning anyway and right. enjoying themselves while they do. Uh, and a lot of that is to try to play to all parts of the audience. You know, mm -hmm. Shakespeare had the groundlings and the folks in the uh, balcony, and he had to somehow create a story that everybody could get something out of. I'm no Shakespeare, but I mean, I try to learn from that model and and try to have a wide appeal, uh, as wide as I can, to, to make sure kids are, are enjoying themselves. I'm just thinking about the through line between sort of Greek, Roman, Norse, and to a certain extent, Egyptian mm -hmm. mythology. I mean, there's sort of the things, and lesser so Norse mythology, certainly Greek, Roman, and Egyptian, you know, they're the things that get taught. Part of me is hoping that we can see more sort of adaptation. Like, for instance, there's a very large Hmong community 
in Wisconsin. And I'm like, well, I'm hoping that the public schools, you know, are, are working that in as well. And are you finding, though, that lots of schools are bringing in the Riordan Presents titles as sort of a supplement to what's because I know Percy has been used for quite right. some time. I mean, you're covering so much ground. With the yeah. Presents. I mean, I, I, I can only speak anecdotally from mm-hmm. what the authors in the imprint have told me. Mm-hmm. And I know that all of them, to some extent or another, are involved in school visits and in outreach and in presentations with libraries. I, I know they're finding an audience. Um, how much that's incorporated in the classroom, I, I'm not sure. I just like the the fact that the books are available, that there's something out there. Because I remember so well when, when the back in the 1990s, when I mm-hmm. was teaching social studies and and literature with middle schoolers, there just wasn't much out there. I mean, if you wanted to teach a a course on you know Chinese culture or you know whatever it might be, South American cultures, mm-hmm. there just wasn't a whole lot to draw from. In terms of fiction, and now it's better. And we still yeah. have a ways to go, but it is better. There is something so empowering about a young reader being able to pick up a book that features a hero who looks like them and shares mm-hmm. their background and has marvelous adventures. But to see that the author of that book also looks like them mm-hmm. and is from their background. That is powerful on a whole nother level. Right. That is so, so wonderful to see. Yeah, representation matters. I mean, when I was a kid, Gene Watsuki Houston's Farewell to Manzanar, which seminal American book, hugely important. But for a long time, that was the one that you saw. And I was kind of mm-hmm. like, well, can't we have more? Mm-hmm. Right. And I was one of those kids who, as a younger reader, ended up in the adult section of the library very quickly because I was kind of like, well, hi. Yeah. Isn't there more? And I think it's really amazing what we're seeing with middle grade and YA, certainly, and picture books. We're just getting broader and more inclusive. And I think it's really great to be able to pick up a book and see the truth of your own life in the details mm-hmm. of someone else's. Like, So the idea that you can be a kid from you know anywhere USA and pick up mm-hmm. one of these Riordan Presents books and think, oh, yeah, sometimes school is a drag. Sometimes my mom nags. Like, to see... Yeah your experience, and then you get to go fight monsters. How excellent is that? Yeah. It's really wonderful. What do you think you're going to end up doing next? I mean, are we going to see sort of the Celtic mythology the way we saw Magnus Chase in the Norse? Uh, Well, that was the plan, and I would love to go back to that. It, It got rather derailed because uh, of the the, uh, TV project, which was very much all consuming. So it was two paths converged in the woods and I had to choose, I had to choose which one. I'd love to get back to that other path. I would and uh, hopefully I, I will. But I don't know. I mean, uh, we have uh, the TV show, we have the new Percy book, we have, you know, Celtic mythology bubbling on the background, other adaptations in the work. So there's a lot going and I I guess I will just have to juggle them as best I can and see what comes up next. Daughter of the Deep Daughter of the Deep, coming yes. as well. Okay, that is uh, yes, that is being adapted. Um, we just turned in the script right before mm-hmm. the strike. If things get back to uh, business, I, I, and I think it looks like they are, then uh, we'll we'll see where that is. And Jules Verne. I mean, again, that's part of why I was thinking sort of collaborative because mm-hmm. you're very open about how Jules Verne sort of spurred on Daughter of the Deep. And I remember when we posted a photo of you scuba diving on mm-hmm. BNN's Instagram. It was off the charts. Everyone was so excited. <laughs> it was a really lovely moment, but you, you're watching the engagement kind of do that Rick Riordan. Thing, which is <laughs> Good to hear, it's yeah. It's a delight to see, but I have to say I'm looking forward to that as well. I want to go back to something about Percy, though, for a second, just listening to you talk about other projects and what could happen. I was under the impression, and I think... A lot of folks were under the impression that The Last Olympian and even Nero, the Tower of Nero in the Trials of Apollo series, that that was kind of going to be it. And I know you spoke to this sort of earlier in the show, coming back to Percy, because of the 
film, but do you miss this kid when you're not actively writing about him? I know we've got this great cast with heroes and, you know, we've got a great cast with Trials of Apollo, but it seems like Percy kind of has your heart in a different way, maybe. Oh, sure. Yes. I mean, because of the very personal nature of the origin of Percy's story, because he is so much my son's, but also myself, he definitely holds a special place. He's he's the the keystone of the entire sort of mythological universe I've created. And he's like a member of my family. He's right. uh, he's very easy to spend time with. So yes, that I do miss him uh, when when I'm not writing about him, but I always feel like he's he's there. Rather like my sons, you know, now that they're adults. I may not like see them every day, but I always feel like they're there. You know, they're 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 always uh, just a phone call mm-hmm. away. I know you've said this before, but I love this line that kids read faster than you can write. That is true. Yes. So and it is absolutely true. And they are it's again, it's wonderful to see. But how are you going to keep up two books a year and whatever this television piece may be or film piece may be? Yeah, no, I don't I don't think that's sustainable, really. And that wasn't okay. the plan. OK, <laughs> as you mentioned. As you mentioned, I mean, the mm-hmm. idea was uh, that I was going to kind of semi-retire and sort of enjoy myself taking classes and being a student and learning and writing less. And my sons love to tease me that I, I'm terrible at retiring uh, okay. because they see everything that I have going on now. It just kind of happened that we had The Sun and the Star and The Chalice okay. of the Gods come out the same year. And yes, I did think that you know, I probably wouldn't be writing another Percy book. But as I'm always, I always try to be careful to say, never say never. I never know what's going to come up. And uh, it happened the way it did. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with, uh, with uh, how it's been received. So I I will keep uh, sort of pacing myself, you know, year to year and uh, doing what makes sense. There is no master plan uh, for me at this point. I am just a doing what I can every year and and enjoying myself. I really appreciate that, that there's no master plan, that you're just in this world and spinning stories for kids who are hungry for story. I think that is oh. so charming and lovely and wonderful, and I really appreciate it. Is there anything you wanted to talk about in this conversation that maybe we missed? I'm trying to stay away from spoilers, obviously, because we are taping pre-publication on Chalice, and there's so many fun moments in this book, none of which I want to speak about here, because <laughs> <laughs> the book is not yet out. <laughs> ah, but soon, soon. I am just very grateful that readers have stuck with me for as long as they have and continue to enjoy them. I never expected the books to do as well as they did, and I mm. certainly never expected to have a career um, at this level for so long. It's right. been uh, a great honor and a privilege to be able to do what I'm doing and have people read the books and enjoy them. That's um, that's something I never get used to and I never take for granted. So I'm just, uh, uh, every day is a success. And that seems like the perfect place to wrap. Thank you so much, Rick Riordan. Chalice of the Gods is out soon. It's out very, very soon. And obviously, how many books are there now? It's 40-ish on you and 40-ish on, I mean. I mean, I think just in the Percy world, there's like 15. This will be 16-ish. Okay. Ish. But yeah, I have I think I've published in total 30. And then the imprints, it's a whole other thing. In other words, you can spend a very long, long time with Rick Riordan and these wonderful characters. And I hope you do. And even if you're an adult, Go get them and go talk to your tiny people about them because they're really fun. They're so much fun. Thanks again, Rick. Thank you. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of fantastic books to go along with today's special Rick Reardon celebration episode. I'm Mark coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Madison, who's going to kick things off. Jump right in, Madison. What do you got for us? Hi, I'm Madison. I'm joining you from my Barnes & Noble in Los Angeles. And when I was thinking of what to recommend, I stuck to the theme of mythology and chose a Japanese, kind of if you're into Japanese mythology, I went that route and I chose The Beast Player by 
Nohoko Uashi. This is a young adult fantasy, so it kind of falls in the same vein. And we follow the main girl, Elin. She can communicate with magical beasts. And her and her family at the beginning of this book, they care for the water serpents that form the core of the kingdom's army. But then when the beasts, the serpents mysteriously start dying, Elin's mother is sentenced to death and she must be sent off into hiding, essentially. And this is kind of where she learns that she can communicate with both the serpents and the flying beasts that guard the queen. So you get to see her on this journey of kind of not only like self-discovery, but also like discovering like her roots and how it pairs with the serpents and the flying beasts and why she can communicate them. And then it evolves into this story of how can she save them from being used in war because she is part of like a war-torn kingdom. So kind of saving these beasts from, you know, not necessarily slaughter, but like demise because with war comes death, unfortunately. What I love about this book is it goes so in depth about the descriptions of the beasts, about the world in which Elin inhabits, that it really puts you there and you are able to like, just see it in your mind. I would say if you're like a fan of like Studio uh, Ghibli, especially like how those films are put together, very on track. Those descriptions are very on track with like those films. And I just love the character. She's very smart and intuitive and you get to see her grow and you get to see her connect with these creatures. And at her core, she wants to save them. So I think it pairs really, really well, especially if you're a mythology nut like I am. Because I love these types of books. It's what I grew up on. So that is why I chose The Beast Player by Nohoko Uashi. Ah, fantastic pick. And I think that's a good transitional book for fans of Rick's work to then go with something slightly older age-wise, but in that same field. And yeah, good mm-hmm. choice. It's a lovely book. Well. Uh, yes. Well, <laughs> I went with something that kind of feels still in line with uh, Rick Riordan's work, and it's the first book to spearhead Rick Riordan's Presents imprint, where he partners with different authors to explore mythologies from all different types of cultures. The book is Arusha and the End of Time by Roshani Chakshi, and it's, again, the first in a series that really jump-started this imprint that is exploring mythologies from all over the world, and it's so fun. We follow this 12-year-old girl named Aru. She is essentially feeling fairly dull in comparison to her schoolmates and her friends. Her friends are going off on trips and vacations and having a grand old time. She is tending to stay at home with her mother in their museum that her mother runs. In an effort to kind of feel and seem more interesting, she has this habit of spinning fibs, letting these friends know and these classmates know that she has a much more interesting and elevated lifestyle than she is actually living. But when one of those lies is challenged, Aru unwittingly unleashes a demonic evil upon the world. So, you know, go figure. The book explores Hindu mythology in a very interesting and beautiful way. And it really carries a lot of themes of friendship and family, of belonging and destiny. Um, Aru not only unleashes something um, pretty terrible on the world, she also discovers this mystical ancestry that she didn't even know about. Kind of similar to maybe a Percy Jackson situation. The book and the series are full of humor and heart and, of course, grand adventures. And it is one of my, I would say, top three to five go-to hand cells out of the young reader section when I have customers coming in, when I have young people looking for something new and fresh, it's a great place to start. So check out Arusha and the End of Time by Roshani Chakshi. Uh, But that's all we have. I could celebrate Rick Reardon all the doodah day, but (laughs) I think we have to let this come to a close. Thank you so much for tuning in to Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Madison. You can follow my home store at BN Events Grove. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Happy reading. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, 
please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.